All right, so this is the first lecture of amino acid metabolism for Unit 3, and we're going to start you out with amino acid catabolism, which is the breakdown of amino acids. So just for review, catabolism is breakdown, and then anabolism is buildup. And the way I remember that is Anabolic steroids are used by people to build up muscle mass, and so anabolism used to build up. So protein consumed in the diet supplies the following. Sulfur, necessary amino nitrogen, and then the essential amino acids for protein synthesis. And the, remember, the essential amino acids are amino acids that the body is incapable of synthesizing. So some amino acids the body is able to synthesize, and others you have to be consumed in the diet. Now, excess amino acids consumed in the diet are not stored like, they, like excess carbohydrates stored as glycogen or excess lipids stored as triglycerides in adipose tissue. Amino acids that are beyond the necessary daily metabolic needs are, are catabolized, so they're broken down. Their nitrogen is excreted in the form of urea, which is, is considered the major end product of amino nitrogen metabolism. So you have amino acids here. They're broken down and used for metabolic processes, and then whatever's left over is broken down into ammonia, which is then urea, which is the final waste product here. Now, if you recall, amino acids can be used for in the citric acid cycle. They can also be broken down into acetyl-CoA, which is a key component that can be used for fatty acid synthesis, can be used for, to synthesize ketone bodies. So amino acids can be used, but they're typically only used in prolonged periods of fasting where you'll start breaking down protein. Proteins in the body are in a constant state of being synthesized and degraded, also known as turnover. And this is mainly due to the fact that you don't store excess amino acids that are consumed. So amino acids from proteins ingested in the diet are mixed with amino acids from protein breakdown and undergo catabolism. So you have your dietary protein here. It gets it mixed in with this amino acid pool, which can also be contributed by breaking down body proteins. And then these amino acids can be broken down. Amino acids, if you remember, can also be used such as for neurotransmitters or other non-protein structures. And then the, what's ever left over is broken down into ammonia and urea, the final end products. And then here again, this just illustrates what we talked about, how during periods of fasting, amino acids can be used to synthesize ketones or fatty acids. They can also be used for gluconeogenesis to synthesize glucose. If you recall, we talked about that in the gluconeogenesis lecture. And then the last point we'll make here is that the continuous metabolic breakdown of amino acids makes the consumption of dietary protein necessary to replenish lost amino acids. And again, that goes back to the fact that you don't store excess amino acids. So whatever gets used up has to get replaced in the diet. So consuming amino acids has to be a regular thing. Degraded amino acids are converted into the following. The majority is urea, also ammonia, and then creatine. So glycine, arginine, and methionine are utilized to synthesize creatine, which is mostly present in the muscle. This is the same as the creatine supplement you hear about, where people will take those for working out and, and improving sport performance. It's the same molecule. So it starts with glycine combining with arginine to be converted to guanidinoacetate within the kidney. And then that is transported to the muscle, liver, or brain, where it undergoes methylation to form creatine. And that methylation is carried out by a molecule called SAM, which stands for S-adenosylmethionine. We'll go over SAM in more detail in a later lecture, but for now, just know that SAM is a methyl donor. So it donates a methyl group, and in this case, that yields you creatine. Creatine can then be phosphorylated by creatine kinase using an ATP to give you creatine phosphate. And then creatine phosphate can undergo non-enzymatic degradation, releasing a phosphate to give you creatinine, which is excreted in the urine. Now, the purpose of creatine phosphate is say in the muscle where you've used up a lot of ATP. So during low ATP states, this could be in other tissues as well, but in low ATP states, creatine phosphate is sort of acts as a phosphate storage mechanism or a store of phosphate. And so you have a buildup of creatine phosphate and so you have low ATP. Creatine kinase is a reversible enzyme. So it can go back the other way to give you creatine and then take the, essentially take this phosphate off of creatine phosphate transfer it to an ADP, and that yields you an ATP to help replenish that ATP. Carbons and nitrogens from several amino acids are utilized for de novo synthesis of purines and pyrimidines, so nucleic acid synthesis. 
Now, another thing we'll talk about here is nitrogen balance. So when the amount of nitrogen consumed is equal to the amount of nitrogen excreted in the urine and the feces, the body is in nitrogen equilibrium. So nitrogen consumed equal to nitrogen excreted is, equal, is nitrogen equilibrium. Now you can also have positive nitrogen balance. So that's where the amount of nitrogen consumed is greater than the amount of nitrogen excreted. And some examples of this are periods of growth, where you're essentially having a lot of anabolic processes going on, periods of hypothyroidism, and then also periods of tissue repair and pregnancy. That's all for positive nitrogen balance. Now negative nitrogen balance is when the amount of nitrogen consumed is less than the nitrogen, the amount of nitrogen excreted. So the amount of nitrogen you're consuming is not adequately replacing the amount of nitrogen you're excreting. And that's in periods of, say, patients who have burns, because a lot of protein breakdown with burns, fever, uses up a lot of metabolic activity, hyperthyroidism. And then also periods of severe fasting where you have to dip into and break down proteins and use amino acids and during periods of fasting as well. Those all lead to excreting more nitrogen than you're taking in. So now we're going to talk about the catabolic breakdown of amino acids. And the first step of that involves the removal of the alpha amino group. So just to review, with an amino acid structure, you have the alpha carbon, which is bonded to a hydrogen, and it's bonded to the R group, which is unique to every amino acid. And then you have a carboxyl group, and then you have the amino group. And this is what we're talking about here. So it involves removing that alpha amino group, which can then be incorporated into other compounds or it can be excreted. And the two processes that carry this out are transamination and oxidative deamination. And these two processes, they provide ammonia and aspartate, which are the sources of nitrogen and urea. The first of those processes, transamination, it involves the conversion of amino groups to glutamate. So the first step involved in that is transferring the alpha amino group from the amino acid. So in this example, we have alanine, where you're going to transfer the amino group from alanine over to alpha ketoglutarate. And what that does is that forms glutamate by adding that alpha amino group to alpha ketoglutarate. And then it also generates, in this specific example, pyruvate. But in general, what you're doing is generating an alpha keto acid from this original amino acid. These transamination reactions are catalyzed by transaminases, which is a class of enzymes that are each specific for one or a few at most amino acids. So they're either for one specific amino acid or say maybe a group of amino acids, like two or three. And e each of these enzymes, they're named after the amino acid that's donating the nitrogen. So in this example, you have alanine donating it. So you have alanine transaminase. And this is because the acceptor of the amino group is almost always alpha ketoglutarate. So you have alpha ketoglutarate here, which is almost always accepting this alpha amino group from the amino acid undergoing catabolism. All transaminases require peroxidyl phosphate, which is a derivative of vitamin B6. And transaminases are intracellular enzymes. Therefore, when they're found elevated in the serum, when you do a peripheral blood test, are indicative of damage to cells with high levels of these enzymes, such as liver or muscle. So a classic example of this is when AST and ALT levels are measured, and often the ratio of AST to ALT is also calculated. And AST stands for aspartate transaminase, and ALT stands for alanine transaminase. So if you see these highly elevated in the serum, these are often indicative of hepatotoxicity or damage to the liver. And so these are often measured as an indicators of the health of the liver. So alanine transaminase catalyzes the transfer of an amino group from alanine to alpha ketoglutarate, like we talked about. This yields pyruvate and then obviously glutamate from alpha ketoglutarate. This is a reversible reaction, but during amino acid catabolism, it he heavily favors the formation of glutamate. Aspartate transaminase, in contrast to most transaminases, does not transfer amino groups to form glutamate. It transfers the amino group actually from glutamate to oxaloacetate, which forms aspartate in the process and then regenerates an alpha ketoglutarate. This is significant because aspartate is a source of nitrogen in the urea cycle. 
Other examples of transamination reactions include cysteine aminotransferase, which catalyzes the transfer of an amino group from cysteine to alpha ketoglutarate, which forms glutamate, and then mercaptopyruvate. And then another example is branch chain aminotransferase. So this is an example of one of those enzymes that catalyzes a group of amino acids. And, this, and specifically in this case would be the branch chain amino acids. So it takes the amino group from any one of the branch chain amino acids, transfers it to alpha ketoglutarate, which then forms glutamate, and then as, as a result you have a branch chain keto acid. So oxidative deamination is a reaction that occurs in conjunction with transamination to generate the release of free ammonia. So transamination, you have your amino acid that generates a keto acid. And then it also involves donating that amino group to alpha ketoglutarate. To generate glutamate. Now, glutamate is the only amino acid that can undergo rapid oxidative deamination, and then the enzyme that catalyzes that is glutamate dehydrogenase. And it catalyzes the release of free ammonia from glutamate to yield alpha ketoglutarate. So, in a sense, it's regenerating alpha ketoglutarate to then be used in other transamination reactions. And it uses NAD plus as a cofactor, which in the process generates an NADH for us. You can also use NADP plus to generate NADPH, and this enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase is present in high levels in the liver and in the kidney. So this is a bidirectional reaction, and the direction of this reaction depends on the relative concentration of the reactants involved. So glutamate, alpha ketoglutarate, ammonia, and then the cofactors, NAD plus or NADP plus or NADH or NADPH. So let's say you eat a protein rich meal, and as a result of that, you're gonna have a lot of amino acids coming in that are gonna undergo transamination. So you're gonna generate high levels of glutamate as a result of all these transamination reactions in the liver. So then oxidative deamination is gonna continue to proceed in the direction of amino acid degradation, which further generates ammonia in this NADH. So in addition to transamination and oxidative deamination, the following five amino acids can be converted into ammonia via direct deamination. So the first group of enzymes here is dehydratases. So you have serine dehydratase, which catalyzes the, the direct deamination of serine, generates a pyruvate and free ammonia. This is an error in your book. We apologize about this. Cross this off. It should be threonine. threonine dehydratase, which catalyzes the direct deamination of threonine to generate alpha-ketobutyrate and your free ammonia. Then you have hydrolytic deamination. So you have histidinase, which catalyzes the deamination of histidine. Then you have asparaginase, which catalyzes the deamination of asparagine to generate a free ammonia. And then you have glutaminase, which catalyzes the deamination of glutamine to generate glutamate and free ammonia. This is an important enzyme that we'll talk about on the next slide. So glutamine along with alanine are major modes of transport of ammonia between tissues. So in the muscle, we'll draw some skeletal muscle here, glutamine is synthesized from glutamate which is catalyzed by the enzyme glutamine synthase, and then this glutamine is transported into the blood, where it then goes to two places, the small intestine and the kidney cortex. So in the small intestine, it's used to support net alanine synthesis, And then in the kidney cortex, the amino group is removed from glutamine by glutaminase, which then in the process generates glutamate. And then this ammonia is used to buffer the acidity of the tubular urine. Now the purine nucleotide cycle is a process present mostly in the muscle, and it uses AMP, to generate IMP 
and ammonia. So this is occurring in the muscle. This is catalyzed by an enzyme called adenylate deaminase, and this generates free ammonia in the muscle for glutamine synthesis. So you synthesize glutamine with this, And then glutamine is transferred to the kidney where it undergoes two deamination reactions. So the first one generates glutamate and free ammonia. And this ammonia is used to titrate the acidity of the tubular urine. Now glutamate undergoes another deamination reaction which generates alpha ketoglutarate. And this alpha ketoglutarate is then converted to glucose within the kidney cortex. The following amino acids undergo decarboxylation to generate biologically active amines, and all of these utilize peroxidyl phosphate, vitamin B6, as a coenzyme. So you have histidine that gets converted into histamine, and then tyrosine can get converted into dopa, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. We have an entire lecture dedicated to that pathway. And then you have glutamate, which can get converted into GABA, and then serine into acetylcholine. All right, so that concludes our first lecture on amino acid metabolism, catabolism of amino acids.